Good evening and welcome to On the Record, a debate style television talk show where Bahamians will find the balanced, true, and open debate they've been looking for. We live in a world where global communications is as simple as the push of a few buttons in the palm of our hands. Births, deaths, and even international tragedies are shared instantaneously via social media. Even the traditional media is struggling to keep pace with the constant sharing of new information on social media, be it all fact or fiction. And then there are the scams, account hackings, fraud, and fake identities. The proliferation of cyber crimes is the latest challenge to law enforcement agencies the world over. When then candidate Donald Trump coined the phrase fake news, the term helped us to identify with the erroneous stories passed off as authentic reporting. The recent elections here in the Bahamas gave us our first real taste of fake news as daily posts of fictitious stories made the rounds. And more recently, a member of parliament was falsely accused of appearing in a sexually explicit video that went viral. In tonight's show, we will explore the growing threat of cyber crimes and look at how social media is shaping our political views. Our guests will include a law enforcement officer attached to cyber crimes, and later we have some social media experts in studio. It's all on the record. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. Our discussion begins on the other side of this break. On the Record is brought to you by Alive, the nation's newest and best LTE network. Good to be alive. With a world of offers from Alive, you can set yourself free. Buy any $99 handset and get a second handset free. Plus everything you need for both phones, all for free. It's our biggest offer ever. We are Alive. Uh, what are you doing? Calling the bank to order more checks. Go to epbahamas.com and order your checks from Executive Printers. Executive Printers. We're the authority in business and personal check printing in the Bahamas. Come in and see one of our specialists or visit us online at epbahamas.com to design and order your checks today. Get faster internet speeds for free when you get TV, internet, and phone. Ask for Trio from Rev. Rev, join the revolution. Store illegally obtained data. Our guest for this segment is Superintendent Mark Barrett, who comes with a wealth of knowledge of cyber crimes and heads the cyber crime unit of the Royal Bahamas Police Force. Sir, um, welcome to the show. Glad to have you on um, with us this evening. Okay, uh, certainly it's a pleasure, and just let me uh, extend our gratitude on behalf of the Commissioner of Police for allowing us this opportunity where we can partner with you, but not only partner, but we can sensitize members of the public as it relates to the dangers as it relates uh, to the internet. Well, we're going to sort of go through all of that, but I, I want to talk a little bit about sort of what, you know, how, how we got to this issue of cyber crimes. I mean, you know, we, we suddenly be had access to all these wonderful devices, our laptops, our cell phones, iPads, iPhones. Um, everywhere we go, we have an electronic device, and I don't think people realize the dangers that come along with these wonderful devices. But I, I want to, first of all, go back to, to the introduction and talk a little bit about what constitutes a cyber crime and how people become involved in these activities. Okay, essentially, cyber crime is any crime committed where the computer is either used as, or any digital device, electronic di digital device, is used as a tool or it becomes the target. 
mm -hmm. and that essentially there is cybercrime. And give us an idea of some of the things that really constitute cybercrimes. I mean, you mentioned, mentioned them briefly in the beginning, but some of the things that constitute that you see on a daily basis that people are involved in. Okay, we have various forms of cybercrime. Uh, it can, it, cyber crimes often involve uh, individuals. Okay, let's talk about individuals, crimes where individuals are the primary target. Uh, we have various forms like identity theft. Uh, we have the defamation of character, which also spring into intentional libel. Mm -hmm. We have child pornography. We have warriorism. Uh, it is so vast when we talk about cybercrime. Uh, we have fraud, we have forgery, we have credit card theft, uh, skimming, uh, phishing, wishing, we have business email compromise, and that is a phenomenon that is, that is somewhat uh, affecting the Bahamas as I speak now. Uh, when we talk about business email compromise, BC, that is often uh, referred to. And so we have various uh, forms of cybercrime that are being committed out there. So let's talk a little bit about the, the portion that, that deals with defamation. I mean, I see things that are said and posted about people all the time on social media um, that really cause me sometimes to cringe and to pause. And I wonder what is the recourse and is this legal for people to say the things um, and post the things that they do? Okay, let me explain this to you. Because it's a form of bullying. Right. When we talk about uh, bullying, bullying is simply the sending or the posting of harmful, cruel text images or text images using digital communication devices. Now, we have individuals out there who believe that they have the freedom to do a lot of things because they are within the confines of their homes and they have the freedom to speak, but with freedom comes responsibility. And we have these individuals who would formulate their thoughts uh, without any recourse, send out information, disparage people's characters, reputation, uh, but we do have ways and means of dealing with those individuals. The law speaks to it, Jerome. Uh, we have uh, the Libel Act, uh, Section 315 to 320, uh, which speaks to anyone who writes or put into effigy anything with the intent to bring disrepute to one's character or reputation, he or she then commit an offense, uh, which is punishable by law. And when we talk about the punishment, we're looking at two years imprisonment and a fine of $10,000. Interesting, and I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of times the victims of these attacks feel like they have no recourse, feel like there's nothing that can be done. There are WhatsApp messages, um, Facebook posts, Instagram posts that go out um, that really uh, impugn the characters of, of, of lots of people and they feel they have no recourse. So if you find yourself, whether you are an individual or I guess even an organization, find yourself in that position, what do you then do? What should happen? Okay, if you find yourself, okay, what you should do is to report that matter to the police. Any, Specifically to the cybercrime unit? Not necessarily, not necessarily the cybercrime unit. Okay. The matter could be reported to any police station within the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Interesting. But uh, you can come to the Central Detective Unit, Cybercrime Unit, mm -hmm. and you can also report the matter directly uh, to us. Uh, once that matter is reported, we would see that an investigation uh, is conducted to that report. Mm. And then what happens in the course of the investigation? How are you able to um, trace back to where something happened because a lot of times things go viral. I mean, things come into my phone all the time. Um, I may not forward it on, um, but I, I receive things and I think to myself, this can't be right. Um, some, something should be done about this. I mean, yeah. what happens once you, once you report that, that crime? Okay, once a matter has been, uh, once a matter has been reported to the police and we launch an investigation, uh, one of the first things we do is try to obtain the phone number, the last number, that percent. Take, for instance, a WhatsApp uh, conversation. Normally these things go viral, so it will be somewhat difficult. But there are ways and means that we can go about in trying to identify uh, who's the, who these uh, culprits are. One, we have what is known as an IP address, and each cell phone have what you call an IMEI uh, number. And so these 
two are associated with a device. Take, for instance, your cell phone. You use your cell phone to send uh, a message, okay? The IMEI is a unique identifier for that particular device. You need an IP address in order to connect to the internet to communicate with another device. And so we normally t use these forms, uh, these methods in, mm. in, in, in driving our investigations. So bottom line is you can, <clears throat> through, through the use of technology, really uh, trace back to the source of, 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 of where this would have started. In most cases. Interesting. In most cases. Now, I, I know that in a lot of instances, people receive these things, whether through um, their phone, whether it be through, through a WhatsApp message or through <clears throat> a post, or will receive the message and then post it via Facebook. But how much responsibility is on you as an individual when you receive something and you decide to send it out in mass or send it out to other people? Okay, I would say this. The sender is just as culpable as the person who produce whatever it is that is being circulated via social media. Uh, it's something like stealing and receiving. The receiver is just as guilty as the person who actually stole the item. I say it like that so I could put it in a term where we all can understand. And so anyone who find themselves sending uh, these images or whatever it may be, they can find themselves being arrested and subsequently placed before the court uh, for these matters. And I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of times people send things out because they think it's cute or funny or want to share, not realizing that they are a part of, you, you are a part of the crime. Yes, yes, essentially they are. You know, and, and behemoths, we always want to be the first yeah. to share the news or the first to place something in a group. And we have many groups on social uh, media. And, and, and what, I, what I would say, uh, Jerome, we need to be responsible uh, for our actions. Uh, we need to take into consideration uh, others' feelings. People have families uh, who are being affected as well as themselves by these things that are often posted on social media. And so we, we, you know, we, we are a loving set of people. And we was always like that. But we need to be responsible for our action, especially when we're dealing with smart devices. Well, I'm, I'm happy you brought it up, and those people who are always quick to be the first, I hope they'll be the first to be arrested when it's time to, to, to give an account for their actions. But at the end of the day, what is the, what is the ultimate punishment if you are found to be um, guilty of, of this cyberbullying? Okay, cyberbullying, and I, 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 I think I, I somewhat mentioned that, mm -hmm. because it falls underneath Defamation. Defamation. Okay, so the crime is defamation. Unintentional libel. Okay. And you're looking at the punishment again, which is two years imprisonment okay. and a fine of ten thousand dollars. Interesting. And a fine. And a fine. Okay. And and this is this is uh, once you like any other. I'm just going to stop with it. Once like any other criminal matter. Once the investigation, uh, you found evidence in your investigation. It then goes to the court. Yes. Yes. Now bear in mind. Some acts are more egregious than others. Mm -hmm. And so those egregious acts, yes, definitely we would place them uh, before the court. And then what then happens to the material? Is it any way to, to, to sort of scrub the internet or uh, scrub social media of, of these things once they have gone up? It's highly, highly difficult uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we seek to have the information removed. Right. But as you're aware, uh, your your digital device, uh, your electronic device. That is also a storage device. Yes. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, people store this information for any length of time. Mm -hmm. And republish it. And, yes. yeah. Yeah. and so it's highly difficult to, to remove them. Okay. So uh, we are going to now take our first break in the show. We're speaking to Superintendent Mark Barrett of the Police Forces Cyber Crime Unit. We'll be back on the record right after this quick break. This segment is sponsored by Percy's Island Game. 
There is no better tradition than a father and son going fishing, and that's why the Island Game is giving away five Father's Day packages that include a half-day fishing trip for four, a gourmet lunch to take along, and of course a cooler filled with your favorite beverages. Did we miss anything? How about some fine cigars and $300 cash to make it a Father's Day you won't forget? The Island Game is a Bahamian tradition just like father-son moments, so don't miss out this June and enter to win at the Island Game. Hey beautiful, let Amani Hair put you in the spotlight with our fabulous hair and hair care products. Longing for length? Try our wide selection of Remy and Virgin Hair. Keep it natural with hair care lines like Carol's Daughter, Ali K Naturals, As I Am, and many more. Be radiant with our wide selection of skin care products. Have questions? Connect with Amani Hair on Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. Located Soldier Road and Shakur Way. Telephone 698-1155 or 422-1191. Let Amani Hair make a Barbie out of you. We are back with more on the record. Cybercrime is a wide range of malicious activities, including the illegal interception of data, system interferences that compromise network integrity, and availability of copyright infringements, illegal gambling, the sale of illegal items like weapons, drugs, or counterfeit goods, as well as the solicitation, production, possession, and distribution of child pornography. We are talking about cyber crimes in this portion of the show, and our guest is Superintendent Mark Barrett of the Royal Bahamas Police Force's Cyber Crimes Unit. Um, first part of the show, we really talked about um, cyberbullying and defamation and libel. Um, this is another big and growing issue, um, and that is to do with um, the compromising of data, data stealing, identity theft, things of that nature. How big of a problem is that becoming in the Bahamas, or, or already is for all intents and purposes? Okay, yes. Uh, we do have various forms of identity theft uh, here in the Bahamas. First of all, let me explain to you what identity theft is. Identity theft is simply this, where you have criminals uh, who steals people's information for financial games. Now, they use bits of information such as your name, your date of birth, your phone number, and or address, uh, your NIB number, your credit card information, or your bank account information. Now, how do they obtain this information? There are various forms and methods uh, that they use or employ, uh, such as phishing, our uh, email compromise, uh, and, this com and these are various forms of social engineering. Uh, and then you have uh, various scams such as, as business uh, email compromise, uh, the uh, mystery shoppers scam, and they, they employ so much uh, methods to obtain our personal information so that they can use for their game. How do you sort of safeguard yourself from becoming a victim? I mean, a lot of times you will receive an email or people ask you for information or you just get stuff. And sometimes, you know, it, I guess in your excitement um, or something just looks <laughs> too good to be too true. <laughs> um, and and you, you give out information. Yeah. How do you safeguard? Okay, if it is too good to be true, then is. it is not <laughs> true. Yeah. Okay, now how do we safeguard ourselves? One, be need to verify the, uh, the emails that we receive, particularly if we are operating uh, in businesses such as financial, uh, financial institutions. Um, when you conducting a uh, transaction or receiving emails, you need to verify that that email is authentic. Uh, one, you should know uh, the person's uh, email uh, contact. Take, for instance, Jerome, Sawyer at CableBahamas.com and not Jerome Sawyer dot one at CableBahamas.com. Mm. You and so pay attention to the address. To, to the address and mm. that is very important and we find a lot of people are becoming victims because they are not paying attention uh, to the emails and then you have to be careful, careful of the links uh, that you are clicking on because for the most part when you click on these links. They have what you call hidden Trojans uh, behind these uh, URLs. Uh, and people use that 
to uh, install key loggers and that then uh, intercept all of your data that is being transmitted uh, out via the internet. And so wow. we need to pay attention. Sometimes you get emails as well asking you to verify bank inf banking information and things of that nature. Yeah. And, and all of that you should avoid, eh? Yes, you should, you should avoid all of that. And, and before you uh, verify anything, you need to authenticate. And I always tell people, authenticate, authenticate, authenticate. Mm -hmm. uh, one, if your bank calls you to verify your account online, the first thing I advise people to do is to contact your bank via your phone, okay? Uh, speak with your banking officer and ask them if there are any changes uh, being made with, re banking, with regards to their banking policies. Mm -hmm. If not, then don't. There is also a danger, um, you and I spoke about, of using um, Wi-Fi um, that is unsecure. You go into coffee houses, you go into business establishments, and people are always uh, using free Wi-Fi or are asking for access to Wi-Fi and then accessing personal information while on, their ne on that network. Yes. Uh, for the most part, uh, most of these, I'm not saying all, but some places that offer f free Wi-Fi, uh, they are accessible to vulnerabilities, network vulnerabilities, and this is what the criminals like. Uh, they would go, uh, they will monitor these various uh, hotspots and Wi-Fi hotspots, free Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, they install or they would offer uh, free Wi-Fi off that Wi-Fi, okay, and they use that uh, to steal your information. You know, a lot of times if I'm out and there's something important I need to do, I'll use my phone as a Wi-Fi hotspot. Yeah. Or if there's sensitive information, as you would say, as you told me, use your, your secure network at your home. At your home, mm -hmm. yes. If, if you must access uh, your, take for instance, your banking information, mm -hmm. I advise people to use a secure network, uh, like your home. Uh, that is secure. You set up your, 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 your network, your Wi-Fi, uh, with your account. Uh, use uh, your phone hot as a hotspot, mm -hmm. and you access that through your phone. Uh, be wary uh, if you would go into other institution uh, and, and you, are, you are uncertain that their network uh, is secure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what is phishing and how that has impacted um, a lot of people and what, what, how, that is, uh, how that is even growing and the impact that's having. Okay, phishing uh, is simply this. Phishing is where you have criminals. They send uh, information purporting to be from a legitimate institution, take for instance your bank or some fi other financial institution, uh, government agency, or someone of a reputable uh, character to unsuspecting uh, individuals. And what they would do, uh, they would send these information out and it's some form of baiting. And the first person that accepts or by debate, okay, then becomes a victim. Take for instance, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, you have social media, Facebook, where people would generate a Facebook page of a Jerome Sawyer mm -hmm. who uh, is purporting to run uh, some endowment uh, fund and they are requesting people within their contact listing, their friends listing, uh, to support uh, this endeavor, and then you have unsuspecting individuals who okay, think it's me, who think it yeah. is you, mm -hmm. who then uh, send monies. That right there is a form of phishing. Are behemoths victims uh, to this type of offense? Yes, they are. And so we want to advise members of the public out there uh, once you log on, uh, particularly to your social network account, such as Facebook, and you receive. Uh, such emails where people purporting uh, to be an individual requesting funds, endowment funds, or 
and, and the like, be wary. Uh, contact the police and inform uh, your beliefs. And if, if it's legitimate, then it'll be fine, but certainly yes. cautious is not too cautious. One area that I did want to, to speak of, though, is um, um, if we can go back a little bit to, to the earlier segment. There are a lot of um, these online tabloids um, that are out there giving out all kinds of information, attacking people's characters, saying all kinds of things that are untoward, um, and they're, they are on social media, they're coming uh, via email, uh, they're being posted, and I guess fall into the realm of fake news. Mm -hmm. um, what is the recourse in that instance as well? If, if you find yourself a victim, or even if you find your business a victim um, of these online tabloids who are, are, are attacking you or, or you know, maligning your character? Okay, uh, essentially, the internet is not governed. Mm. Uh, there aren't any policies per se to govern what we put out there on social media. But if you have a server in the Bahamas, if you have an individual that resides in the Bahamas, if you have someone who is saying anything to bring disrepute to anyone, particularly that person holds public office, or if they cause that person to come to general hatred or ridicule, ridicule that person will be culpable or complicit. He, he, he or she then commits a crime, okay? And they can be punished by law uh, with this crime. Interesting. Okay. And have people been punished and served, have people gone before the courts and served time for this kind of activity? Uh, we have had instances where people were charged. Uh, I give you two cases. Um, in one instance, we had an incident, an, an, an incident where we had three teenage uh, school children who published some defamatory Mm -hmm. uh, material online about an educator. Uh, the matter was brought to our attention. Uh, those individuals were taken into police custody. They were eventually sent before the court and subsequently to uh, the Bahamas Department of uh, Correction Service, Correctional Services, formerly HMP, after having been convicted by uh, the courts. Uh, we had another incident uh, where we had uh, again, a female who was somewhat bullying and sending, sending deformative or derogatory information about another female. Uh, and unfortunately, this student, a female who was, who was, who was also a student at uh, UB, formerly COB at the time, uh, and she sent out this material, she too uh, was placed before the court and was subsequently convicted and sent to the Bahamas Department of Correctional Services, formerly uh, Her Majesty's Prison. Well, that's good to know, and I'm happy you said that because there are a lot of people out there who are, I would use the term, suffering in silence because they think that there is no recourse for what has happened to them, and there are perpetrators out there who continue to defame people's character and say all kinds of things and, and post all kinds of information that's untrue, nasty, mm -hmm. um, and certainly not the kind of thing that, that, you need to, that, that should be published in a public space. So, mm -hmm. sir, um, uh, Superintendent um, Barrett, I thank you for, for coming on. Just before you go, I want to just sort of want you to leave folks with some advice. Mm -hmm. If they find themselves, whether they're a public figure or not, if they find themselves a victim of cyberbullying or a cybercrime, um, whether it be identity theft or whatever, what should they do? Okay, if anyone who finds himself being a victim to any form of cybercrime, uh, sometimes you may not know uh, that you are a victim to this crime. But if you are and you feel as though you are, you can report it uh, to the cybercrime section at the Central Detective Unit, Royal Bahamas Police Force. Uh, the numbers at the Central Detective Unit is 502-9906-9956-9992 or 9991. And we want to say this to Jerome, we want members of the public to know that we do have the capability and the capacity of dealing with these types of crime. And anyone 
who is found committing these crimes, they will be dealt with to the fullest extent of the law. They will be prosecuted and to the courts, if convicted, sent to prison. And so we just want to advise them. And a word to the wise is sufficient. Yeah, definitely. Superintendent Mark Barr, thank you so very much for stopping by and imparting that information to us. Um, I'm sure a lot of people um, are a little bit more comfortable now and feel that they have some recourse uh, based on what's happening out there. Thank you very much, sir, for stopping by tonight. We are at the halfway mark in our show, and our guest for the first portion has been Superintendent Mark Barrett. Uh, we've been discussing cyber crimes. We appreciate, of course, you stopping by. But coming up in the second half of the show, we are going to be discussing the effects of social media with some social media experts. Stay with us. We'll be back with more on the record on the other side of this break. Caller ID, call forwarding, call waiting, and three-way calling. Hmm. <laughs> Here's the scoop. With Rep Voice, you get more than 17 calling features for free and save $250 a year, and you can buy your kids ice cream. They'll thank you later. Cut the blue wire. Get Rep Voice. Save money. For news that's happening in our country, the best place to turn is our news. Good evening, Bahamas. Coming up tonight. The biggest on stories on the best station. Opening news tonight. The government collected almost. The Education Minister the Bahama Bahama Claims Committee explains how unsecured. Giving you all sides of the equation to keep you informed. Well, in other news, police are cracking Managing down on the Jimmy. claims of Bahamas creditors and former. Police are on the scene here at a popular high school. Statement hangout. yesterday, Catholic Archbishop. Watch our news weeknights, 7:30 and weekends at 7 p.m. only on RTV. Welcome back to the second half of tonight's episode on the record. Our discussions tonight led off with the discussion on cyber crimes. We looked at in the first half of our show how cyber crimes are affecting the society on the whole. Now we begin discussions on the effects of social media. Social media really consists of interactions among people where they create, share and or exchange, exchange information and ideas in virtual communities and networks such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat and YouTube and the list goes on and on. Our guests in the second half are social media experts, Urabina Apia and Xavier Knowles. Welcome to On the Record. Um, glad to have you in studio tonight. Thanks so much Thank for you. having us. My pleasure. Listen, social media to me is like one of the most fascinating things, I think, of my generation, the generation <laughs> behind me, um, and certainly for future generations. And I think more so for me, because I sort of watched it um, come into force. I right. mean, I remember when we only communicated via email. Right. But social media is such a big part of our lives nowadays. And we really want to begin the discussion with talking about how it's really impacting our day-to-day -day living. I mean, we went from just going on to seeing what people were doing to, you know, we begin our day uh, and end our nights <laughs> on social media. It's true. So I want to you know, talk about how it's really influencing our day-to-day -day living. Well, one of the things about social media is that it's, it has the ability to connect people, you know, like you said, wherever they are in the world, um, whatever they're doing in the world, it's an opportunity and gives persons an opportunity to really share in real time what's happening in their day-to-day -day lives. And so it's like you said, persons, ha persons now begin their days before they roll out of bed, they pick up their phone, scroll through Facebook, through, scroll through Instagram, you know, check their Twitter feed to see what has happened to see who's up to see um, you know just what's going on in the world before they start their own day so mm. it's become a major major part of people's everyday routines not that we are insulated from the rest of the world but really how has it impacted uh, our lives in the Bahamas well social media is, is the source of everything so people go to social media for for jobs <laughs> or find out where to get this from or how to contact this person or this company and so forth so forth. Even now, um, in order, persons won't even p buy a newspaper anymore. Mm -mm. In WhatsApp now, <laughs> I actually get all of the front line, um, the, a snapshot of all the front, um, front line headlines. I mean, I'm sorry, the headlines are all the newspapers mm -hmm. in my WhatsApp in the morning. So in the morning, I can see like five different 
um, headlines. I just go through them like, oh, that's what the Guardian said. That's what that one said. That's what that one said. And it, it's amazing. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, Zebra's absolutely right. People depend on social media in a very real way. Um, whereas we would have picked up a phone book to find a phone number. Mm -hmm. You just put in a status. Does anyone have the number for the passport office? Because, <laughs> I re because I'm really not about to scroll through the phone yeah, book. I'm yeah. not. I'm not going to do that to myself. Yeah. Someone online has it, and they're going to give it to me because I asked. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's something that people literally depend on. People go to social media for recommendations, and there there are now groups on mm -hmm. on social media mm -hmm. for that very reason you can go in and ask people who have you know what their experiences have been at a particular restaurant or mm -hmm. dealing with a particular government agency or you know I with the process gardener. yeah I need a gardener I, I need a I need yeah. a nanny I need a nurse I need some mm -hmm. all of that is now at their fingertips through social media this is of course speaking to the positives <laughs> and the good <laughs> side true. of it right. and, and it, it is a wealth of information yeah. for me I, I tell people it's a wealth of amusement <laughs> you know I, I pass the time um, or like you say or keep up with information it is mm -hmm. it is a way to get breaking news yeah. even um, because people are sharing and sometimes you're not in front of a television or you don't know what's going on and you know you're, there's a bombing here there's an accident here I mean we just saw it with the tragedy with the seven-year-old girl the mm -hmm. other day how that went viral and people were really even, really quickly yeah um, you know were really concerned and, and continue to express their grief but there is the downside to this wonderful tool Definitely. Um, that has connected the world and made us made it made us really a very a, a, a in the truest sense, a global village. Right. Mm -hmm. Where I think where social media um, has found its strength, that same that that same uh, you know force that has given it so much power is also the thing that makes social media very dangerous. Um, because people have this immediate access, you can say whatever you want on, on social media, and it'll get everywhere mm -hmm. before anyone has time to vet it. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest things that we've seen now, especially locally, where we have such a small, a small society and a small, tight-knit community. Things go around so quickly, and there's no time to really vet what is being said. And that's where we have seen some of the issues you know, come up, and we've seen these instances where the wrong information has, uh, has had time to get around so quickly that when you follow up with the right information, sometimes people are not listening to that mm -hmm. anymore. They, so they don't want to hear it. They've already mm -hmm. formed their opinions about it based on that initial first report that went out. You know, I always have, a friend of mine always says, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> and then, and then um, the other part mm -hmm. of it is that um, because social media is free and it's accessible mm -hmm. to everyone, mm -hmm. no one is really held responsible to what they put out. Mm -hmm. And because everyone has it, you don't, they put whatever they want on it. And in some cases, these persons don't have the right intentions. Mm -hmm. I was going to so, ask, sometimes it seems to me very deliberate. Yeah. People will put out, and I, if I can use the Donald Trump <laughs> term, the, <laughs> the fake, fake news. news right? yeah. um, but it, it seems very deliberate, which, which brings me now um, to really why I, I would have invited you here in the first instance to talk about the impact of social media on the recent general elections. Mm -hmm. Every political party, even the independents, had their own Facebook campaigns, mm -hmm. um, which, first of all, is far more, far less expensive than the traditional forms. Definitely. And I really want to talk about how parties use that effectively in the, in the recent elections. Uh -huh. I think Sylvia made a really interesting point. It's free, for yeah. the most part, um, you know, and you can spend ten dollars on, let's say, Facebook ads and reach. Thousands wow. of people. Well spent. Yeah. That's, that's the best ten dollars you're ever going <laughs> yeah, to spend. Yeah, yeah. Okay, literally, it's the best ten dollars you'll ever spend. So you have an opportunity um, to reach different kinds of people, and not just reach your target audience, but reach the people that they also interact with. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I think this time around we saw all of the major political parties, and like you mentioned, the independents, and and all those people who are running and who are affiliated with parties, use social media to reach the people they needed to reach. Um, whether that was done through, you know, attack ads or um, memes or whatever, whatever the, the, the primary um, focus of the ad was, they used that as an opportunity to reach as many people in their, and the thing is you reach people in the places where they are most comfortable. Mm -hmm. it, you, they're at home, they're laying in mm -hmm. bed. You become, it becomes ingrained in their, their specific environments. And everybody's home environment is gonna be different, but the impact is generally the same. And then the, the point is that this election was really decided by millennials. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of millennials that 
wanted to know what's going on. So the political parties use that to their advantage. So they make sure to put out all of their information, all of their plans, all of their goals, whatever their selling point and was. And mm -hmm. attacks. And attacks. Yeah. And attacks um, on social media. Because you know why? Between the hours of 7 a.m. to probably 12 a.m. or maybe 1 a.m. The, uh, the following day, most young people have their phone in their hand mm -hmm. until they go to bed. Not just young people. So well, people in general. Right. Young what? people. And yeah, but we're speaking in the millennial yeah. context. Yeah. yeah. And that's, it was very important for these political parties to reach the millennials, mm -hmm. reach young people, reach persons that have this access to social media. Because guess what? When you could put something on the news or you could put something in a newspaper, but after you finish with it or after you watch it or after you finish reading, it, go, it goes. And there's no guarantee we'll catch yeah. it that day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but I might be distracted, not read the paper. But if, watch it. if you put it on social media, yeah. it stays. It's, and it's bound to catch someone's attention. Even if, if it doesn't catch your direct attention, someone in your circle will see it. And they go, did you see that? Did you yes. see what? Oh, did you hear that? And, and that's the power of social media. And I think, um, you know, in that regard, political organizations this time around did a very good job of of using social media to their advantage. Mm -hmm. I want us to, we're gonna take a look at a couple of the, the ads in our next segment, but I want to talk about the, how it worked against mm. some parties or some individuals as well, because a lot of information that was circulated um, to the public came via social media. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you keep in mind that the election campaign really did not heat up in earnest until after Easter. Mm -hmm. But that period before, you know, it's, the campaigns were alive and well on social media. Yeah. And there was a lot of information being put out there. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, or I'm not sure, was that deliberate in many instances of, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna go on the attack? Because there's really no face behind that information. Mm -hmm. I think, um what you had in the run-up to, to this past general election was not necessarily the work of political organizations directly, but a lot of their surrogates. Um, and that's where a lot of, you find a, a lot of the negative, um, you know, the negative ads and a lot of the negative feedback would have come from. You had persons who were affiliated with the parties on some level mm -hmm. who used their own personal social media, who created, um, you know, attack pages and, okay. and um, you know, created ads specifically designed to target another political organi organization. Um, and obviously that's part of, you know, the attack ads and things that are, those are things you come to expect over time. But I think social media really amped it up this time around. Um, and I think we, locally we took a lot of cues from what was happening in the, in the U.S. Most yeah. definitely. So we're going to take a, a, a break now. We're, certainly our discussion um, still has a long way to go. We've got a lot of stuff to discuss. So stay with us. We are going to be back on the record talking about the effects of social media on the other side of the screen. When you get TV, internet, and phone, ask for Trio from Rev. This is us. We all live here. We don't always get along, but when we do, we can do some pretty extraordinary things. Every single invention was made on this planet. Every machine, every theory, every piece of art, everything. The entire history of human knowledge lives right here in the palm of this young lady's hand. Now just imagine the possibilities. We are alive. I want to meet him in Bamboo Town. He is not going to carry my things anywhere. And if I can't get it, you will have it. They want you to believe that the only choice you truly have is between the PLP or the f and M. Or should we say the lesser of the two evils? But the truth is, your choice is between proven failed leadership and corrupt governing, or hope and change for a better life through the DNA.
We would have seen there a, a uh, online commercial produced by the DNA in the run-up to the last election. Um, powerful in the message mm -hmm. um, and really speaking and bringing the party's message directly to the people. Mm -hmm. If you watch, like me, and you don't watch a lot of <laughs> television per se, but you would, I, I would have seen that yeah. through my through my online, you know, through online traveling. And why was that? Why instance, why pieces like that so effective? Go ahead. Well, <laughs> I would say that it, they use it to play on emotions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they mm -hmm. played on, um, the, I guess, the the record of the past governments, and they said, well. This government did this, that government did that, they wanted the same, so they wanted to play on emotions. They wanted to play on emotions of how the Bahamian people felt during the past two elections. So that's what they did. They played on emotions. Were they built, were these pieces built specifically for online use? I think definitely um, a lot of the campaigns, a lot of the ads that you would have seen on online were definitely built for the online market. Um, they weren't the traditional maybe 30 seconds, 60 yeah, seconds, they short. were shorter. Mm -hmm. um, to account for, you know, your Instagrams, to account for your Snapchats, where the video spaces are a lot shorter, right? And those, um, you find that those kinds of ads grab people's attention because it doesn't have to hold your attention for very long. I saw people complaining that every time they went to watch a, a oh, YouTube, YouTube yeah. video, video yes. there was the, a local the political, political campaigns hijacked. That, yeah, hi, they it, hijacked yeah. YouTube. Every time you went to watch a video, you saw an ad from one of the political parties. And honestly, that, that's just good campaigning. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just online. That's just good online campaigning. Um, you know, I think you... It happened so much um, that people started to get slightly annoyed by it. Mm. But very annoyed. <laughs> they but literally, yeah. you could almost verbatim repeat those ads. Yeah. You know, so they they're, they were I'm, effective. Yeah, I was about to say, mm -hmm. with the content playing, then that's then where you see the effectiveness. Exactly. Of it. Mm -hmm. I want us to now uh, take a look at, at the the Free National Movement's ad. One of their ads that they would have been playing online, and we'll pick up the discussion right after that. He made so many promises. We in the PLP, we have big plans to fight crime. And we've suffered through all their broken promises. Big plans to reinvent education and training. And five years of their big empty plans. rhetoric. Big plans to expand the Bahamian economy. The PLP has ruined our economy by serving themselves at our expense. Can Bahamians really afford five more years of Perry Christie's big plans? Big plans. Big plans. Oh, wow, um, <laughs> very powerful. But what I find interesting, though, is a lot of what is contained in that ad um, seems to have resonated with voters to the polls. Definitely. I think what we saw at the polls, especially concerning the PLP, was an indictment of, of, of their record, mm -hmm. right? An, an indictment of the organization. And so I think there were so many instances, I think, like the other political parties just had, just make a list. <laughs> you just have, just go down the list. Okay, this happened, this happened, this happened. Oh yeah, this happened too, I forgot about it. And so you reminded people of all of the things that they were so angry about, um, you know, with this, with this administration. And you put it all in one ad and say, are you really, are, can you really afford, can you really take another five years? That messaging really resonated with people because they, they were sick and tired of being sick and tired. And as you can see, what the Afrinam actually did, all they did was present facts. Mm -hmm. And they just pushed it out in your face. It was like this, 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 mm -hmm. this, and this. And this is actually what happened. This is what happened. What I found interesting too, from my perspective, some of the things that I saw in those ads, I thought, oh wow, I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow, that. That did happen. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and it's one of those things where, and social media has a way of doing that. Even if you look at some of the social media functions now, they have like a memory function mm -hmm. where they bring back things that you may have said mm -hmm. a year ago or two years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the ads, um, particularly from the FNM camp, did that. It was like the memories, the memories from your face, like, you remember when this happened? Yeah. Do, you, do you recall? Mm -hmm. You know, and they, they pushed it to the forefront of people's minds again, and people got upset all over again. There was something that, that was very popular to the political memes. Mm. Mm. Um, the best part of the political <laughs> where yeah. They were capturing <laughs> images and, and going on the mm. attack, and it mm -hmm. came from, from both sides. Mm -hmm. um, even very brash and, and, and uh, sometimes inappropriate, <laughs> um, I thought. But people seemed to buy into it. Well, um, the, the memes were basically selling a message. And as you know, Bahamians, we love gossip. We love anything that's hot and juicy. So once that came across them, and there wasn't much for them to read, because you know the, the, 
the notion that we don't like to read here in the mm -hmm. Bahamas. And it, it was it captivated their, their eyes. They just took, took it, read it, laughed, and shared it. It was almost like a day. Uh, uh, you were almost waiting on a daily basis yes. for, the new memes. For, the, for the new memes. But, I, but memes are, you know, the wave of the internet. It's how it's, it's the best part of going online. It's the best part of using social media. Is, you want to see the, you want to know which individual had the time which person thought of this? You know, who yeah. did this? Yeah. And yeah. it's always that thing where you're waiting on, on the next funny moment, it, you know? It, it shows that we really do have some creative folks out we there. Do. We do want to take a look also at the, at, at the ad produced by the Progressive Liberal Party uh, to try and counter what was happening um, from, the, from the two opposition forces at the time. So let's take a look now. Prime Minister Christie is looking out for all Bahamians. He has really showed his commitment to the Bahamas. The Prime Minister most definitely had a vision for Bahamian people. When you look at our number one industry, tourism, it's the pristine environment. The Prime Minister did major changes in policies. He's been able to make a real difference. The Prime Minister has always been instrumental on wanting Bahamians to be first, and he was adamant about making sure that the beach soccer facility from design to construction be Bahamian known, Bahamian driven to show what we can do. When Prime Minister created the National Training Agency, he really had Bahamian people at heart. Creating NTA not only helped me, but it helped a lot of unemployed Bahamians. The National Training Agency is a life changer. The Prime Minister is very dedicated that we will have national health insurance. He has committed to help the people of the Bahamas. The Prime Minister shows what Bahamians can do. You have to take on some of the big fights if you're going to really make a difference. Well, that seemed, that ad um, took a very different approach, mm -hmm. talking about the successes of the PLP, but very heavily on the Prime Minister. Yeah. And I think that happened simply because they realized that a lot of heat was on the Prime Minister mm -hmm. because everyone were, well, the former Prime Minister, they were bringing him down, they were, um, targeting him for everything that he so he said that he did and so forth. So they tried to build him up because he was he's the leader of their party. And the PLP had uh during their last convention they had this chant where they said one leader, one leader. And they made their self look together. That's why they say forward together. They made themselves look together and say that they're behind that there's their leader and their support that their leader and they're strong. So I guess that's what that that commercial was all about. Just giving support to their leader and saying that they want to move forward with their leader, taking the Bahamas forward together. Yeah, no, I think that particular ad um, took a very different approach mm -hmm. than the others. I think um, they wanted to do some damage control, you know, for Mr. Christie's mm -hmm. um, reputation and for his persona over the, the you know, it, it had taken a hit. And so I think attributing these things, which they saw as successes, to the prime minister was their way of saying, listen, you know, we, there, there's stuff happening, but keep in mind that he did all these things, uh, you know. My question is why not focus on the PLP? Because well, it was very prime minister, prime minister, prime right. minister. Uh, again, I think what they wanted to do was something that was successful for, um, you know, particularly the FNM, I think, in the last election, they made it about the leader. Mm -hmm. You know, this particular, um, this particular ad was, and they wanted to make the entire process about the leadership. Because if you look at it, then, you know, Mr. Christie, you know, just by his years of public service, would have been the most, quote unquote, qualified individual in the race, right? Mm -hmm. Because he had the most tenure. He's been here the longest. He's done this for the longest. He, uh, he's, he's been in this circle for the longest, and I think they tried to make that the issue. They tried to make it an issue of experience as opposed to an issue of effectiveness. Mm. Um, they tried to make it an issue, um, or they tried to make it seem that he would have been the best option compared to the to the to the other two that were. And I think it's pretty safe to say that that backfired. I think instances. that definitely backfired. I think you know they might have stand, stood a better chance um, making it more about the party. Mm -hmm. um, because, I, again, people were so fed up with some of Mr. Christie's antics, for lack of a better word, you know, and they were waiting for something from him that they felt they never got. And so to, to focus your entire campaign on this individual that was, for the most part, really not well-liked in the public anymore mm -hmm. was definitely a mistake. And, and social media actually played a major part in That's that. What, mm -hmm. that. That was good. That you actually mm -hmm. probably read my mind. That was mm -hmm. my next question. To what extent do you think the public listened to what or paid attention to what was happening on social media and responded? Well, fully. 
they, yeah. they paid attention to fully every engaged. detail. <laughs> so fully even in the case of things that Mr. Christie did or so forth, so forth, they, those things got onto social media. He, I don't think he was... He, and I would say his cabinet ministers and, and personalities within the party as well. Yeah, and those things got onto social media and they were a detriment to him and his, basically his career because all of the things that he didn't probably think about or didn't realize that he did or the things that he said or the actions he said, they, persons, they, they captured it and they made sure that it went out there so that everyone can see it, especially the finger. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there were pictures of, of him sleeping mm -hmm. at events and different things of that nature. Yeah. I think one of the things that the PLP failed to understand about, about the electorate now is that we are an instant gratification kind of people, right? So if we say to you as a leader or as a politician, listen, we expect this, we want this, and you don't give it to us, we might. We move on. Which, I'm, and as we sort of come to the end of the show, I, I want to segue into now... The new government <clears throat> has this social media, this animal of, of social media um, to contend with. Mm -hmm. You're not just getting up in Parliament and, and, and speaking um, or passing legislation that's going on. Every day, mm -hmm. people are grading you mm -hmm. on social media, every move you make, every step that you take. You know, I, I'm going to ask both of you, how is this, how is social media the proliferation of social media, um, fake news, um, uh, <laughs> fictional, um, non-fictional. How is all of that going to impact this government's ability to govern? It's going to hold them accountable. Um, I've been watching like the budget debate and so forth, so forth, and I've seen where. As soon as they say something in the budget debate, post it. It's on post. I don't post watch the budget social. debate. I just monitor yeah. Facebook. Yeah, they like talk it. about it on Facebook. Yeah. Oh, they okay. spend this amount of money. This what happened. This is what they're gonna do, and it, it's just keeping them accountable. So, it's gonna play a very heavy part. And if the government doesn't act and they don't continue and they don't be transparent, it's gonna hit. It's gonna hit. It's gonna hit back on them in mm -hmm. the next five years. I think. This Minutes administration sort of rode the social media wave partially into office, mm -hmm. and that, that same wave is going to be the make or break for them. Um, mm. You know, social media will likely decide how people continue to respond to them, um, whether or not people continue to trust them. Uh, you know, like Xavier mentioned, a lot of the things that they have already said you know, once, once it's on social media, it lives on into perpetuity. That's right. It does not go away. Um, there's always going to be someone who is going to pull up that video clip. They're going to mm -hmm. find that text. They're going to find that tweet. Um, you know, they're going to pull it up, and they're going to hold these people accountable. And I think they are going to find that if they are unable to sort of keep pace with, with the changing tide of emotions that that exist on social media, they may find themselves you know, in a similar Problems. position as the PLP. Well, certainly we will be here to watch it as it unfolds. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Robin Apia, Xavier Knowles, thank you so much for Thanks. coming very on the good. show. You've been very, very insightful. Um, I promise we'll bring you back on. We've got to uh, watch this ever-changing environment and see how people continue to respond. And you know, word to the wise is efficient. Even our politicians, watch what you do and where you do it, mm -hmm. because people are capturing your every movement and your every word, whether you think they are not. Definitely. So definitely going to be an interesting time. It'll be interesting to see what will happen uh, five years from now and where we will be for, you know, with social media. Who knows? We'll probably have, a, have it uh, ingrained in our hands. <laughs> Chips, thank you so very much for coming on tonight. We hope you've enjoyed our show tonight to our viewing audience. A special thanks to the Commissioner of Police, Ellison Greenslade, Superintendent Mark Barrett, Ravana Pia, Xavier Knowles, my producer, technical staff, and of course you are viewing audience for watching. As always, it's been our pleasure. Be sure to join us for more On The Record next week, same time, same place. Once again, I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. We'll see you next time.